what the risk factors were for developing tumor lysis syndrome or TLS. To begin with, you want to think about the tumor type as a very important potential risk factor. Hematologic malignancies are at a higher risk than solid tumor malignancies, for example. And even within hematologic malignancies, you want to think about the more aggressive diseases, such as ALL, lymphoblastic lymphoma, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, Burkitt lymphoma, and acute myelogenous leukemia. TLS occurs when a tumor responds to a therapy. So in order to have TLS that's treatment related, you really want to have a therapy that's active for patients. The more active and fast acting, the faster a therapy will debulk a tumor, the more risk you have for destroying cells and for the, in, for the intracellular contents to be spilled into the blood and then to cause the electrolyte and kidney disturbances that can be associated with TLS. The third thing you want to think about is the bulk of disease. A large cell lymphoma that's low bulk might be quite different than a patient who has a very bulky disease. And when I mean bulk of disease, generally it's the size of the lymph nodes, the size of the spleen, how high the white blood cell count is related to the leukemia or the lymphoma. So the more tumor, the bulkier the tumor, the more um, risk there may be for when those cells are killed to de develop TLS. And then the last thing is the patient themselves, their comorbidities. Do they have kidney dysfunction, for example? Um, do they have underlying cardiac disorders or arrhythmias so that smaller disturbances in things like uric acid or potassium may lead to dysfunction, whereas in a younger, healthier patient who doesn't have comorbidities, they may not have an arrhythmia, they may not have a neurological disturbance, they may not have kidney dysfunction. So to sum it up, the risk factors include the tumor type, solid tumor versus hematological, and then the patient themselves and their underlying medical comorbidities. How do I assess a patient's risk of developing tumor lysis syndrome? There are several different models that are used to actually describe TLS when it occurs. One would be the Cairo Bishop classification. One would be the Howard criteria. There are several. Those really describe the TLS event, whether it's a clinical event versus a laboratory event. The models used for predicting whether tumor lysis syndrome would occur or not are in AML or acute myelogenous leukemia. There are several models that are proposed. One that I was involved with involves the elevation of the white blood cell count, a patient's LDH, for example, and their renal dysfunction at baseline. And so predicting TLS is different than classifying TLS. Predicting largely has to do with tumor type and bulk of disease and underlying organ dysfunction. When TLS occurs, you can use several models that are generally the same in terms of classifying the event as either a clinical event or a laboratory event. Laboratory means there's a abnormality in a number. The potassium is elevated, the phosphate is elevated, the calcium is decreased, the creatinine is elevated. A clinical event means that that change in a number led to a clinical manifestation, arrhythmia, kidney dysfunction, the need for dialysis, a neurological event like a seizure, for example. Um, so there's different, there are different ways to predict the event and then different ways to classify the event. And that's how I would break it down. Trying to think about which malignancies are um, leading to the higher risk of developing TLS, the breakdown would be solid tumor versus hematological malignancies. Hematological malignancies by far and away is where the classic episodes of TLS. Um, if you wanna open up a textbook, really the most classic would be Burkitt lymphoma, or ALL um, are the two that are come to mind most frequently in the literature. Um, but there's also several other aggressive hematologic malignancies one would think about, including um, lymphoblastic lymphoma, both B and T cell type, um, certain types of mantle cell lymphoma and leukemic B cell lymphoma, um, peripheral T cell lymphoma rarely, and then chronic lymphocytic leukemia would be the most common hematologic malignancies to lead to a TLS event. Generally, um, again, it's the responsiveness to therapy that often predicts the ability to develop TLS. I think for patients at a higher risk, mostly because whatever therapy you give first to a particular cancer is most likely to elicit the best response. In the setting of Burkitt lymphoma or ALL or AML, this is generally an event that's secondary to cytotoxic chemotherapy. So combinations of anthracycline-based chemotherapy or 7 and 3 or some of the ALL regimens. In chronic lymphocytic leukemia, this can be secondary to antibody-based therapy like anti-CD20 um, antibodies. The drug that's gotten the most attention more recently has been venetoclax, which is a BCL, an anti-BCL2 medication or a BH3 mimetic, which um, 
which has led to some TLS events. Most events are actually minor, but they have the potential to have major complications in a small proportion of patients. And the strategies to address TLS have to do with, number one, knowledge of the risk of the event, appropriate prophylaxis with IV fluids, um, with um, monitoring of the heart rhythm, with uric acid lowering agents, and then appropriate monitoring for the event. What you need to really think about is tumor type, prophylaxis, and then monitoring um, in order to mitigate the risk of having a clinically significant event. With that being said, there have been drugs developed over time, largely focused at the uric acid portion of the equation, um, where the thought is that if you can um, metabolize or increase the solubility or decrease uric acid, you may minimize the risk of having renal complications, specifically uric acid um, uh, crystallization or deposition in the renal tubules. So um, drugs like allopurinol or febroxostat are aimed at decreasing the production of uric acid. Drugs like respiracase, which is a brand name, or uric oxidase or recombinant uric oxidase are aimed at um, metabolizing uric acid to a, um, a urine-soluble form that can then be excreted from the kidney without that higher risk of crystallization or deposition in the tubule. 